you know about Epic Bins? They've been in the in the news in the last couple of years. So there's a generic. There's one. There's one. There's one. Yes, the price went down since I got to do there, so the price went down since the guy went to jail. Okay. <laughs> Did you know how he went to jail? For like a... I don't remember the jail part, but I remember yeah, the uproar. Okay. What else do you know? Hard to Hard to use? Okay, that's good because we're going to talk about that. What else? What? You inject where? In the lake. In the lake? Usually in the lake. Yes. Randy said single use. Single use, there's single use products, right? What else? You have to take good care of them. They, they, are, they tend to even be shorter duration in terms of uh, longevity, shelf life. Isn't their effect um, only like 20 minutes? So their effect is only so long, so you might have to take a second one. True. So uh, that's one thing we're going to talk about in patient education is that that's why they always come in packs of two. Uh, so if the first one, if the symptoms do not abate, then you can administer a second one as well. What else? There's a junior. There's a junior, so there's an EpiPen junior. What else? The generic and brand name are not equivocal. So like you can't write EpiPen and then like mark generic. It, it won't go to the generic because they're not. You like have to like write out like epinephrine auto injector. Okay, she makes a good point. One thing I would suggest is because we uh, have uh, seen shortages, is that when you write for these, write for EpiPen auto injector. That way, the pharmacy can fill with what is available and what their insurance will pay for. Um, or what they are eligible to get in terms of rebates and stuff. So that's that's a good, or if they have a coupon. So that's those are good points. Um, there are authorized generics for EpiPen, so we'll talk about that. That may be something that wasn't available when you worked. There are authorized generics, and I'll talk about what that is versus just regular generics. So it's like the, the mechanism of delivery was different between the generic, which is why they want to that's true. Sorry, I was just asking if EpiPen is the brand name. Yeah. EpiPen is the brand name. But it's kind of like Kleenex. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, you take a tissue, you call it a Kleenex, yeah. so the brand name has become synonymous with that product. So EpiPen's kind of become synonymous with the, those types of products. Okay, what else? I know a lot of people who are supposed to carry them don't. Yes. <laughs> That's true. So another, another, uh, Patient education is they don't work if you don't carry them with you. Okay. What uh, anything else? Yeah. Uh, they wear off in like the minutes. They can. They can. So we talked about needing sometimes a second dose. That's why they come packed as two. What else? Okay. Good. Let's talk about them then. So, anaphylactic reactions, type 1 hypersensitivities, what do you remember? We talked about these in Module 1, and uh, Amy Hughes talked about them in Durham. Immediate onset. Immediate onset. So, that, that separates them from others. So, if someone tells you you had a delay and the hives didn't show up for three to five days, then that's different. So, these are immediate onset. So, what kind of, of symptoms would they have? So angioedema, what is anaphylaxis? Okay, what are symptoms of anaphylaxis? Difficulty breathing, what else? Say Angioedema, what else? Urticaria. Can they have other influence? GI wise, can they have any? Okay, so they can have diarrhea. Can also. All right, so look down there, IgE mediated. So what does that tell you? What do you remember about those antibodies? They're specific for an antigen, right? They attach to what type of cells? Mast cells and basophils. Okay. And when they attach or when they are on those cells and they come and you form an antigen antibody complex, what happens? 
you get degranulation of those cells, and then what do they release? Histamines. Histamines would be one. Cytokines. All type of cytokines. So that is what mediates those long, because remember you have immediate onset and you have delayed onset. Okay, so some of those leukotrienes that are, are released are actually responsible for delay, so that delay can be up to 12 hours uh, as well. Okay, so you see histamines, leukotrienes, cytokines, prostaglandins, uh, platelet activating factor. Oh my gosh, we've heard that one before. So local symptoms, swelling, itching, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, airway obstruction, hives, blood pressure drops. Why does blood pressure drop? You get vasodilation, right? Uh, arrhythmias. Okay, so that's what we are trying to um, treat. So the drug of choice is epinephrine. We just talked about it. We leave, we already know what they're going to do. So they're agonists of alpha-1 receptors. So how are they going to help in anaphylaxis? They're going to vasoconstrict. So we just said that all those cytokines and, and intermediaries of inflammatory response are going to cause vasodilation. So we got a vasoconstrictor that will counteract that and keep their blood pressure from dropping, right? What about the beta action? Okay, so we've got bronchoconstriction, so they're going to have trouble breathing, so those beta 2s are going to help with that uh, as well. All right, very good. So adverse effects, uh, tremors, dizziness, um, palpitations, anxiety, restlessness, headaches can all be side effects. Maybe somewhat different, uh, able to, or difficult to differentiate between what they're also experiencing from the reaction. So serious adverse effects. So you have a potent vasoconstrictor that you're giving, and you can cause myocardial uh, ischemia. I have seen this. I saw it in the when I was a resident several times. We were really treating more asthma, uh, where at least adults have heart attacks. Um, we induced a heart attack in people uh, in giving them and treating them uh, with epinephrine. <coughs> Other side effects are due to the probably misuse of the product. So lacerations, embedded needles, so you insert it and you bend it slightly or you bend that needle, they're very, very thin. Um, I have a picture of this somewhere. There's the needle. The needle is, is about uh, 12 to 16 millimeters long. It is uh, intended to be an IM injection. But you can see where people are very heavy. And this has been a worry in very obese people is that um, sometimes the drug doesn't work as well. Some of it is that it's probably the dose isn't high enough. Uh, the fact that it's going into subcutaneous space is, is thought not to be a worry. IM would be preferred, but uh, it's felt that the drug gets as quickly absorbed out of the subcutaneous space as well. Okay. So, uh, let's see. No absolute contraindications. Uh, not even pregnancy, but your older patients at risk for cardiovascular disease, those would be probably your most concern. So the different products, here's the EpiPen, comes as a two-pack. EpiPen Junior, you already mentioned, uh, comes as a, a pack. They all, all the different products come as two packs. Um, here's what they look like. Uh, you can see the orange end is the pin end, uh, you know, where the needle is, and the other is um, a, the opening where you open it up, take it out, and it has the instructions written on there. However, all these come with a trainer uh, or dummy uh, injector uh, device. 
Uh, so it's recommended, particularly for people who do not use them very often, is that every so often they practice with it. So in the package, they're packed, see that, the, the bottom, it's called, this one they call a trainer. So this one won't deliver drug, but people can practice with it. Anytime you have them change uh, brands, you need to also reinforce that you need to then practice with that device's uh, trainer. It does not have a needle. So it makes you go through the whole process without actually injecting anything. So that's really important, especially for people who do not use them very often. Or the other recommendation is that you, if you're an adult, you tell people around you and make sure that they know what the symptoms would look like and how to inject you. Uh, or if it's a child, that people are going to take care of your child but also know how to use it. Okay. And so that trainer uh, or, uh, can be used to teach folks. You can see this is AdrenaClick. Uh, this is, that's the brand name of it. Uh, another product looks very different. Uh, so knowing how to use one is not going to translate to another. So you can imagine that if you're just sitting there looking at it, you go, okay, I got it. Pull both ends off, take the needle, and then you, it's pretty, after that, you just pretty much apply it in, uh, in I, I'm saying jab it in, but inject it. Uh, but in, when people are stressed, and they're not very familiar, or they haven't done it the first time, uh, then it, it uh, behooves them to uh, practice. Another product is the, uh, I don't know if it's Abe, Abe, Abe Q. This one looks very different. It's more like a, a uh, looks to me like a uh, battery pack. Uh, it's very square, and so you, this one is going to look different. The nice thing with this brand is that it has a very low concentration. So the 0.3s are usually used for adults, the 0.15 for children, and in the packet I gave you, uh, usually it's based on, on weight when you move up to another, the next dose. But for, for young children, for like toddlers and babies, there really hasn't been a dose available for them until this uh, product came out with the 0.1. So these are recommended or indicated for infants and toddlers. And there's the trainer that comes with them. Usually they're a different color. Like in this one, they're gray. The other one, they were gray. They won't be the same color, so people won't grab that one and think it is an active drug. <coughs> this is very similar to the EpiPen. It's opening it, taking the guard off of where the needle is, and then <coughs> placing it in the uh, thigh and injecting it. Pretty much it's just a very firm uh, push into the skin. Okay. Another product that came, it was this one, Synjet was uh, came out last year. I believe it's on the market now. It is actually a, um, a, a syringe, <coughs> uh, so it's not. It's, it it differs from the others in terms of device type, uh, but is very similar in its in its use. Uh, okay, so let's go. Let me tell you some things about the products. Most of these companies will offer some type of, of um, assistance plan. So if commercial insurance does not pay for it, or they don't have insurance, then there are different products that will provide them. Uh, if you go down and look at uh, the ObbyQ, it has a uh, affordability plan. So you can get it for zero dollars if you're if you're an insured patient who has a high deductible, then they'll, the, the company will cover that. For patients who have no insurance, you can apply for, for assistance from the company. This one probably has the most support for people who have no income or very little ability to pay the, the prices. Okay. 
almost no one should be paying a huge out-of-pocket because there are different plans. Um, Walgreens, CVS, Target, if you go on, um, what is it, GoodRx, you can print off coupons for almost all of these. And they're in about the $150 range. If you look up under EpiPen, there are authorized generics of EpiPen. So an authorized generic is kind of a different breed. So an authorized generic would, would be company X produces this drug, produces a drug. As its patents running it out, then other groups can decide, I'm going to market your drug as a generic. Well, when they do that, those companies, Y, Z, and A, have to go back, have to go to the FDA and, and submit a amended new drug application. And then they can, if they're approved, they can market that as a generic because they're a generic company, that's what they do. Authorized generic would be company X is saying, okay, my drug is almost off patent. I'm going to take that entity, I'm going to go back to the FDA and I'm going to say, I want to market this as a generic and then I want to use the same data that I gave you as under the new drug application and the FDA will grant it. Okay. So they market their own generic. It's exactly like the drug. It's exactly the drug. They're just marketing under a, a different label, private label, but it's their drug. So that's what authorized generics are. So EpiPen does now have that. So if you write I think if you wrote EpiPen and put generic, you could, that would be, you could get that. But the better thing to do is write EpiPen auto injector and let the pharmacy figure out which one will work. All of these will work, they're all comparable. They mostly differ in how they're delivered and how they, what they cost. Now, the other thing that the FDA has come out with on the next page is so shortages. So several shortages have, have popped up. One shortage always occurs in the fall when kids go back to school because schools have different recommendations or requirements as to how many pins you have to have and, and, how, and if they can carry them on them and all this. So there's all, fall, fall shortages are common. There have also been shortages from the manufacturer for EpiPen. Uh, so, there is a wait list for a lot of these products right now. So, what the FDA has gone back and done is the manufacturer of EpiPen went back to the FDA and says, here's our data, here's our stability data. So, what the FDA did is they said, okay, on certain lots, uh, and they're listed under the FDA website, certain lots you can extend the, the, their usability for four months. So I read it on and read different blogs of, of folks and how outraged they are that anybody would say use a, 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 a drug that had expired. So I want to talk to you about what that means, what expiration means in the, in the uh, drug world. So in, when drugs are being developed, they talk more about a shelf life. What is the shelf life of a drug? Shelf lives are uh, then used to determine an expiration date. So shelf lives are take into account all different types of factors that could affect the potency of a drug. And the FDA then sets a limit and says when the potency has dropped 10%, that's when we call the drug expired. So according to the FDA, when, when you hit an expiration, your drug has 90% of the drug left if it has been stored under the same conditions by which it was that, that expiration was determined. Okay. That's the kicker. Because you never know how people are going to store drugs. Mm -hmm. If you've got a drug that's very susceptible to humidity and you put it in the bathroom, well, it's probably going to degrade faster. Heat always destroys drugs faster. 
So drug companies have these stability chambers that they put drugs in uh, at a certain temperature and under certain conditions, and they let the drugs sit there, and they sample them every three months, and they look at what's the potency of the drug. So there's a lot of energy that goes into determining that shelf life. So the shelf life is the time required for 10% of the material to disappear. At the end, that's the end of its shelf life. Okay? That determines expiration date. That's why you can you use drugs in your life, you still can get an effect and it's two years old. Uh, so they have found with some EpiPens that even four years after use, it's still effective. That's why the one of the things you can tell people is that if you are in trouble and all you have is an expired EpiPen, it's better to use an expired EpiPen and get to help than it is to not use it at all. So here, pardon? Someone else is Go ahead. Um, this is not just about EpiPens, but just about drugs in general, but when they are older, past their expiration date, is the problem only that they've lose lost potency, or do they ever change chemically so that it becomes a dangerous thing? There are drugs that are dangerous. Tetracyclines never, ever, ever use them past an expiration date, because they will degrade into something that is um, damaging. Drugs that are more um, biologics, I probably wouldn't do. Insulin, I, would, I wouldn't use it past its expiration date. It's too fragile. So the more fragile and the more protein-based a, a, a drug is, the more I would probably not do that. But on a lot of these, it's, it, it's, not, as a, it's not a problem so much. Now, we have never sell them. Would never keep them in my office and give them out of samples. I would not do that. If they're in my possession, I would use them. Uh, so factors that affect, that affect shelf life: moisture, uh, oxygen, oxygenation of products within it, light. Uh, so that's why we usually, when we dispense drugs, we always put them in an amber-colored bottle. Uh, temperature. So if they kept their prescriptions up in the kitchen, you know, above the kitchen sink. In the kitchen window, probably not a good idea. Um, microbes, so it's something that they can get contaminate. Um, APIs is the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Excipients are the things we add to it to keep it together, buffer it, make it, coat it, get it through your stomach. Properties like hygro hygroscopic. What's a hygroscopic? Hygroscopic. And you draw moisture out of the air into your cell. Okay, so it will pull moisture into the product. Crystalline, it's amorphous state, polymorphism, vapor pressure. So lots of things can affect a drug. But all of those, but if it's been stored well, it usually will retain some potency. So expiration dates come off the shelf life. Expiration dates reflect the time period during which the product is known to remain stable, which means its strength, quality, and purity, when stored according to labeled storage conditions, you can you, you know that the drug is potent. Okay. All right. So if patients come in and go, I'm not using this expired pen, or I'm not going to use an expired pen, you can assure them that at least within those parameters that the FDA has come out and said, look, and we've reviewed the data, and it is not for every lot. Uh, we ha have reason to expect that the drug is going to work like we expect it to work. Okay. So I want you to know that, because you will get a lot of questions about expiration dates. Okay. How to use the EpiPen. Oh, so let me go back to this. So two, two, two to three years ago when, the, when there was only EpiPens and they had jacked the price up from $100 to $600 and there was all this outrage. Uh, so what a lot of people started doing was um, getting it um, epinephrine ampules, which are about $10, uh, and drawing them up or handing them out to patients or having the nurse draw it up and giving it up to patients to take home and keep because it was a way to, for cost and uh, availability. 
So, you know I'm a pharmacist. I am telling you, never, never do this. I'll tell you the reasons why I think this is a bad idea, and I'll tell you the reasons why I understand people do it, and if you had to do it, under what circumstances to do it. So, these glasses, these vials are glass. They have an etching around the ampule top. When I break them and I have, and I'm going to put them into a, uh, a diluent, I wear gloves and I have to break it, but glass shards can go down into the ampule. So I always have to use a filtered needle when I withdraw anything out of the glass ampule. So I don't know if they do that or not. I don't know. The other is that if you draw it up into a plastic syringe, you have no idea what the interaction of that drug over long periods of time are with the drug. So if you had to do this, let's say you were in a position where you felt like this was the only option left, you've got to talk to people and find out what is reasonable. So I do believe that there is um, times where you have to resort to these types of things, but at least talk to people. I'm, I'm coming at you with a lot of energy because I can't tell you how much stupid stuff I hear practitioners do because they have no freaking idea what they're doing with a product, uh, manipulating it, and then telling a patient, here's what you can do with it. Seek information. Pharmacies will always give that to you. They should. Your compounding pharmacies are probably one of your best. Is go to a metallic. Here's what I need. What can I do? They will know all of the, the guidelines and recipes that are out there and stability data, and they can give you the best, here is what, here is what can be compounded reasonably. Do that. If you seek that out and you're doing it with the best interest of the patient, then sometimes that's just what you have to do. But don't ever tell people to manipulate a dosage form when you have no idea what it's going to do. Okay? So this... So I understand why people did it, but the other is that sometimes they just gave them the ampules and had them draw it up. Or sometimes they drew it all up and told them to, you know, squirt out a bit, like depending on the dose they were going to use. It, it, leads, it can lead to errors, and now you know if you give too much epinephrine, you can cause myocardial necrosis. Did it happen in everybody? No. But it does have the potential. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a non-lethal drug. Okay, so that's my take on this. Does anybody have another take? <laughs> anybody have experience with this? I did a couple of years ago. I had people who had experience with it out in the rural area. Yeah, I've seen it on that. So a lot of your kits, when you do like an LP, your kit will have the lidocaine with epi or lidocaine without epi in those ampules. Make sure you are using a filter needle. Um, and that kit doesn't supply it, so it's ridiculous. You have to ask for it separately. But be knowledgeable enough to know that if you ever have an ampule with this glass, if you have to break like that, you do not want to be injecting shards of glass in somebody's Yeah. Now. This is pretty much what they look like. I've never seen one that didn't. So right at the hub, there is usually a, it looks like a white cotton uh, material, and that's the filter that will keep it from... And if they say they're more expensive, they are more expensive. I, we don't have any, then say, I'm not using that, get me a different vial of that and that Absolutely. Got some one area that you're not going to slide on. If you argue that, you don't do it, say, well, then you can do a procedure if you Thank you. Very good. Um, okay, um, middle of page, um, okay, I'm in the number of auto-injectors to dispense, I guess I put page numbers. Um, so how many do you give, how many do you give? No consensus, it has been in one study, they noted that about 35% of the time, patients need the second dose, so kind of keep that in mind. Here are some guidelines. Uh, the World Health Organization recommends that it be based on how far you are away from medical care. So for every, what are they say, 10, uh, 10 to 20 minutes of travel, add a, um, an ampule or add a device. In terms of doses, so the .3 is usually for most average, what I see most of you all. For obese people 
and, and I don't know, I can't tell you, here's the cutoff. They recommend two, uh, that they uh, administer two. Children are usually going to use that 0.15 milligrams. <coughs> so this was in the kids for 15 to 30 kilos. Now we have the one for toddlers, so that AVIQ, that uh, 0.1 milligram, for uh, infants uh, between 7.5 and 15 kilos. How to use it? Okay. So most of them are, this is the EpiPen, uh, so it's um, Gripping it firmly, you're going to remove the end. You're going to uh, push uh, into the mid thigh, 90 degrees, okay? Because that'll get it into sub -Q. If you do it 45, you'll you'll hit more intradermal. The other is time frame. So they recommend you keep it in place at least 10 seconds. So I do this with patients. I make them count so they can see because 10 seconds is a long time. It's longer than people think. Uh, and then remove and massage the area that seems to in, in help absorption. After use, get medical help right away. So we recommend that people go and be checked out. Not because the epinephrine is dangerous, but because you may continue to have uh, symptoms. Uh, you can give them an antihistamine if there are the, the parent or the other person could give them an antihistamine if they're on, as they're in group, uh, as another uh, drug that could help. Teaching points. Anaphylaxis is unpredictable. So you want them to always have a low threshold of when they would use it. Uh, so it's more dangerous not to use it than it is to use it if it wasn't needed. Epinephrine's the best, so there are other drugs like an antihistamine, a steroid inhaler for their asthma will not do the trick. It won't be strong enough. It won't stop the laryngeal edema or help their breathing. Carry it all the time. So if you're out eating and it's in your car, it does you no good. Your wife carrying it in her purse doesn't do you any good if you're in trouble. When to use plain language. What's plain language? We talked about that in the very Not beginning. No jargon. no jargon. Make sure it makes sense to them. Uh, if they're having trouble breathing, tightness in their throat, feeling lightheaded, think they might pass out. Uh, if a child isn't responding, if they are eat, if they eat a food, allergy drug that or food that they are allergic to, uh, it is okay to go ahead and treat. If, the, if you know that it is one that causes a uh, reaction. Coughing. Uh, has food allergies and vomiting repeatedly shortly after eating. Flushing. Hives that are starting to appear. Okay, we talked about how to use it. Using a doubt delay. Next page. Call for help and go to the emergency room. So, administer it and I tail it to the hospital or to an urgent care. Uh, what if they get too lightheaded? Well, one is you lie them down, keep cerebral perfusion, put their legs up above, and uh, keep them uh, keep their uh, their brain being perfused. That last one never prop them up during anaphylaxis because they can get that in empty ventricle syndrome and, and die of it. So don't prop them up. More than one dose may be needed, so five to fifteen minutes apart. Practice, practice, practice with the device. If you change, if you go from an EpiPen to an adrenal clicks, you go to adrenal clicks to an OBQ, practice. Teaching others, let them know who in your who in your sphere it would come in contact with you or your child, uh, and, and train them. Okay, so last year they did recommend that auto injectors be replaced yearly. I doubt this gets done because they're very expensive, up to six hundred dollars for two of them, three hundred dollars for two of them. It's a lot of money. Uh, Storing them in neutral temperatures. So in, in Oklahoma, don't put it in your car, um, 
leave it in your car, either in the winter or the, the summer. Let's see. Instructing patients when to inject. So this uh, this is kind of giving for when you are uh, you're probably not in trouble, but it, it's a potential problem. So if there's mild symptoms, but the more remote they are, the further they're away. You're out camping, and you're 45 minutes away from the nearest uh, place to get help. Treat. If the symptoms are mild, but they progress rapidly. If you're just not sure. And then if they've eaten the food or they've got the bee sting or an insect sting that has caused uh, anaphylaxis in the past. Okay. Anything else you would like to know about epinephrine or injectors?